Looks like we're live. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to welcome you all to this webinar, um, Gun Bun from the Ground Up. Literally, we're going to talk about sustainability, regenerative farming practices. It's way more interesting than it sounds. And in Gun Bun style, we're going to have a whole lot of fun at the same time. So first of all, if you've got your wine kit, if you ordered the four bottle kit, um, by all means, dig into that and open those wines and pour yourself four glasses. If you did not order the kit, um, open your favorite gun bun and pour yourself a glass or three for the next hour and join us and have some fun. And with that, this is a webinar, so you don't need to mute yourself. We can't hear you. Unfortunately, we can't see you, but we know you're there. And just give us a shout out in the chat box. Let us know where you're joining from, if you're a club member, um, if this is the first time, second time with us. Um, and with that, my name is Nora. I'm a wine educator here. And maybe you've taken a Pinsgauer tour with me, tooling around in the vineyard and talked a little bit about that sustainability and farming, but this is gonna get way more in depth. We're gonna get down and maybe a little bit dirty. So. Um... <laughs> is that my cue? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nora. It's Jeff. And Joe. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm and so Megan. <laughs> uh, did we do? Okay, so I'm, uh, I, I, I guess the first thing that should be said is look at all these beautiful uh, quotes that are coming in from around the country, Joe. It's They're, very uh, touching. You know, we're all pretty nervous here. And so I just instructed everybody to imagine that everybody out there is naked. So whatever you're wearing, that's our, that's the way that we stay true and tried and ourselves here. Um, but we're grateful that you're here. And this is gonna be a, a fun and interesting panel uh, because we're talking sustainability and we're talking, uh, which is close to our hearts and something that we practice a lot, but we don't talk about all that much. At least if you're the royal we, me and you probably talk about it all the time. I live it. Um, so <laughs> anyway, we're, yeah, the, the rules here are that we're gonna kind of pair some wines with some topics but it's, there's no real rule. If you get thirsty, the first, I guess that's the only rule is sip. If you get thirsty, that's the ticket. But um, listen, before we get into the meat, uh, you know, we never do anything here at Dunlock Bunchy without thinking about setting the mood right. Um, so we're lucky enough, and with us that more often than not means music. Uh, so we're lucky to have an extremely special guest kick us off for this tasting. We started this tradition, uh, we started this, and so, um, without further ado, I want to bring Alex Bleeker onto the set, if we can make that happen, and he's going to sing us a song, and then we'll, we'll talk about how you doing, Alex. Hey, I'm so happy to be promoted to panelist here and happy to join <laughs> you. So uh, Alex is in uh, a band that you might know or that we certainly love called Real Estate. We're big friends and fans of the band. He's in his own band, Alex Bleeker and the Freaks. And most importantly, as far as I'm concerned, he's actually in Bolinas, which is a place that hope you're not supposed to ever find. It's a mythical place on the coast. <laughs> but, but Alex has proved that somebody at least lives there. Alex, go ahead and we'll chat after your song. Okay, sounds good. Well, 
was not so bad Pretty darling It was just a little dream I had So hard for love, it will come, you will find some. White lady knows your name, but please do not hear. But you might not be at all And when you left it was not so bad Pretty darling It was just a little dream I had for all like 100 plus people on here for you Alex. incredible you? incredible i'm just staring myself in the face while i'm doing it which is a novel <laughs> experience well, for looking, me it's looking good and uh so hey you know i what i know that you spent a lot of time in the water over the pandemic uh, that's true what uh what else you've been doing what have you been drinking I've been drinking gun bun Gewürztraminer all even through the winter, you know, obviously. No, I, I will say it, it is a real true favorite of mine and of all of real estates. I mean, uh, my bandmate Matt from real estate was married at gun bun. You know, just the relationship is really strong. We obviously did the echo echo thing together. When I got married, my father was insistent that we have a case of gun bun Gewürz at, you know, I was like, all right, well you, you can buy it. And, and he did, you know, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a family affair for us, you know, that's so awesome. We, uh, we bonded over music and wine and, uh, and echo echo. We even blended a wine together. And I was thinking about that because we just announced our festival with Chica, which you played. Yeah, it's great. I'm going to be there this time oh, around that's, for sure. That's, that's so I'm coming. sweet. It's a great lineup. I know you'll be on it again, but Bedwin's on there. I remember she was with us when we blended that wine. What, what I did was meet them up. Joe, you helped set up a couple of the samples and drove up to Reading and like had this great little shindig in Reading, like blending wine and have this incredible reality estates wine. In fact, if you're coming to Wachika, we're definitely gonna have some of that out. I'm coming, Matt and I, Matt, you know, my bandmate in real estate for everybody else who doesn't know, he texted me today, oh, like, oh, we're going to this, you know, and we'll, we'll be there, um, yeah, I, for sure. You know, I know that you're not playing Wachika, but you're playing another little boutique festival down the coast, huh, that I have to imagine as a surfer, super bummed about. Is that gonna be your first show this year? It is, it's gonna be our first show since, I don't know, uh, March, 2020. And uh, I, I don't know if you remember, Jeff, but you said you were gonna come and be our psalm at the festival, well, so. I, you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, for those, of the, the festival I'm referring to is called the Ohana Festival. And it's got this, you know, kind of punk ass wannabe musician named Eddie Vedder who puts the whole thing on. <laughs> Maybe I can get down there and help you psalm up for him. But it's actually like, it's a great lineup and I, I bet you guys are stoked to be there. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun for sure. We're stoked to be anywhere this year, but. Uh. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, listen, uh, you thanks a lot for that. That was such a beautiful song and you're gonna come back, I think at the end and-, uh, and Definitely. Well, and we appreciate that. Now we're gonna get into, uh, into the meat of the day. Thanks, Alex. We're gonna talk about sustainability. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a big topic to talk about, you know, especially when uh, the reality of how we do things is that there is so much activity that's related to sustainability as part of our universe um, on our day-to-day -day operations that um, 
putting it all into kind of a cohesive uh, like plan here to talk about. It's been a quite an endeavor and this is the first time we're doing it, but it's pretty fun. Our, our basic philosophy though is to, for today is to kind of show you how we do things uh, and then talk about the labels, right? Because there's a lot of labels between you know, organic, sustainable, biodynamic. We're going to introduce a new one, uh, regenerative farming here. We'll get to that at the end, but we, I'm a big believer in like showing off our feet as opposed to our, our labels first. So we're going to talk a lot about what we're doing here. Um, it's mostly going to come through Megan, who is on the call here, and she's going to get introduced in a second, but uh, she spends 100% of her day thinking about sustainability, and she's going to walk us through a lot of things, but it's a, it's a collective team effort, like I said, um, and we're going to bring her in. That, but first, I will talk a little bit about sustainability and what it actually means, because I did go to the all-knowing, uh, you know, Lord of Knowledge, Mr. Google, to look up sustainability, and uh, I have my script right here. Uh, what it basically said is that sustainability is the capacity to endure in a relatively ongoing way across various domains of life. So that's a little existential. In our case, it's our family business. In the 21st century, it refers generally to the capacity for Earth's bios biosphere and human civilization to coexist. Now, um, that is perfect because it kind of lends into the first Thing to think about when you think about Gumlock Bunchu, the Bunchu family and sustainability. It is essentially, uh, you know, what it says the 21st definition in this sort of existential, 21st century definition in this sort of existential way. You know, we've been at our version of sustainability since the middle of the 19th century. And it's been as selfishly oriented as, as, as more than anything, really, because when you live on a property, when you make a living from the property, when you eat and drink things that are grown on the property and that you hope they'll leave this property for your kids and their kids, sustainability is something you lean into without ever naming it because you're constantly thinking about the next generation. You're constantly thinking about what you're putting in your body, what you're doing to your environment right around. So our little microcosm, which is Line Farm right here, you know, really has honestly qualified as sustainable for over hundred plus years in terms of the way we've gone about it. We live here, it's, uh, that, 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 that's philosophically driven, but it's also selfish. Not only do we live here, but the second point is that we're going a crop and a version of a crop that lends itself, leans into sustainability. Wine grapes by nature, we celebrate nuance, we celebrate variation, vintage to vintage, block to block, things that we want. You know, a, a, a lot of conventional farmers are about like homogenizing the process so you create the same widget of a, of a produce every essentially every release or every time you, you put something to market. We're the opposite of that. We celebrate diversity. We celebrate the, the nuances of the, the different spinach to vintage. And that is another thing that sort of happens as a result of being sustainable in the vineyard. You know, you, you, we, we, we don't want to add things to it or engage in ways that are going to over, that are going to, you know, blend down the nuanced flavor by adding too much water, eradicate some of the vine variation by like broad fertilization or sort of a macro conventional approach to it. So it's basically, we're kind of leaning into it because it, it's what we do, uh, but we do do a lot. And, and that's, we'll, we'll talk about the specific names uh, about how we do it in a second, but first we're gonna get into the gritty. So Nora, go ahead, tell us what's next. First of all, um, if you've got two glasses, put both Chardonnays in one each um, and compare a little bit uh, between the Estate 2019 Chardonnay and our 2016 Heritage Chardonnay and maybe later Joe can tell you a little bit the differences between the two. Um, but I wanted to go back also to Jeff's great, great, great grandfather who founded this place. And first we keep saying Rhine Farm and, and maybe some of you don't know that word, um, but it is the name of the vineyard that Jacob Gunlock um, named this place honoring his, his family land back in Germany. Um, and it's been that way ever since. So it is just the name of the vineyard, which is what we're really talking about today. Um, and, and 163 years ago when he founded this place, um, after coming here for the gold rush, he actually knew what the real gold in California was and that is water. So while we are enjoying a little Chardonnay, I'm going to hand it over to Megan, our sustainability, 
it gets so hard after you say it a few times in a row, say it three times fast, you can't. Sustainability Systems Manager, we are so happy to have her and she's gonna marry those two topics together. Thank you. Hi yeah. everyone. I couldn't be more excited to be here, but I do want to start off by talking about what Nora was leading into, which is water. And I'm sure as everyone is fully aware, we are in an extremely, extremely bad drought. We actually reached exceptional drought, which is the worst here. Um, and that started in May. So May was actually our driest month in the past 127 years. So if you're thinking about that, that's almost our entire Ouch. that we've been living here. And that's the worst that we're looking at. So that's changing some things in the way that we implement our practices. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But as far as water goes, we've been conserving water um, since the beginning. Um, we've been capturing our storm water in this beautiful pond that you're seeing on your screen right now. And if you've been to Rhine Farm to taste, you likely have overlooked this beautiful pond, but that's actually fully capturing our storm water. So we are taking that water and that's where we're irrigating our vines from. And if we can't capture it in that pond, then it's going to our wastewater ponds at the bottom of the pond, at the bottom of the property, which is fully run by solar. And we're recycling the wastewater taking it back up to our vines. So uh, we try to conserve water as much as possible. And especially in this year, that's super important. Um, and we practice regulated deficit irrigation. And for those of you who are not familiar with that term, um, it's essentially stressing your vines to the point that they're not fully watered. And you want to do that for the optimal fruit quality, which might sound a little backwards, but I'm sure Joe will elaborate on that. Um, however, if the water stress becomes too severe, then that can affect your vine health as well as your wine grape quality. So in light of climate change with all of these sh shifting patterns, we aren't really able to pinpoint as much as we used to, the way you would look at the farmer's almanac or the um, typical sequences of the seasons, you can typically look at the vine and say, hey, this is where we need the water. Um, well, now it's not so much the case because of climate change and the different weather patterns. So we are bringing in a lots of new technology that have been really helping us out here on Rhine Farm. What you're seeing now on the screen is our Western weather station. So this allows us to um, do some rain gauging. We're measuring how much water we're gathering throughout the season. Obviously not that much this year, um, but we also connected to it. We have a soil moisture probe. And if anyone is aware of Toll Merritt, our all-star operations leader, um, he was super instrumental in bringing that over from Africa um, whenever it first enter entered the market. So um, he was actually able to bring that over to wine country um, and get the soil moisture probes infiltrated into your everyday irrigation management decisions. Um, but what actually, um, what we're seeing is that our soil moisture and everything is super unpredictable. So what has been transitioning in technology, we used to use uh, what you're seeing back here, which is our pressure bomb. And the pressure bomb is about 30, 40 pounds. You take that out into the vineyard and you're lugging it. You're strapping it onto the ATV. You're lifting up and down. You're sticking the leaves in. You got user error. You got all kinds of different things that don't really make it super easy to make on the spot irrigation decisions. So what we've done is um, partnered up with Thule and Thule is an evapotranspiration sensor. So we're able to actually measure real time in the vineyard actual evapotranspiration, which is the first technology that's been able to do that. And it, their goal is to basically replace our soil moisture probe and the pressure bombs so that we can get a better pinpoint of when and why we're irrigating the vines. And that helps us stress them to the point where they might be about to collapse, but we're not gonna let them do that because we want fruit, optimal fruit quality. And that's essentially what we're here to do. And then Joe takes it from there. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. Yeah. <laughs> so here, right here is a, what that Thule sensor. Wait, can I just stop for a second here? <laughs> <laughs> Breathe a little bit here. That's a lot. We're going <laughs> deep into, yeah. going into the weeds, so to speak. Um, and it's important. 
uh, you know, I just wanted to take a breath and go. I'm really excited to get back to the to the graphs. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's my yeah, excitement yeah, every there, day. There, there she fun. is. There's Megan right there. Megan, say hello again so we can see Hi. her face. <laughs> there, and there's the pressure bomb. I want everyone to look back there behind the pressure okay. bomb. You have to keep so here we have the pressure bomb. Yes, this brand. We have our tank uh, heater. Okay. This stays pumped with nitrogen gas. And, and it's a way to, you stick the leaf in down here. Um, it's just this whole system where you're measuring the leaf water potential in real time. And it's just fun because behind that is some stuff that was obsolete a hundred years ago. And now that <laughs> thing is obsolete. Yeah. We're even going to these soil things that live like and are kind of, are they almost artificial intelligence? Like, yeah. I, yes. I, yes. They're I, actually yeah. running off AI. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, let's go back and look at those uh, those graphs because I'm excited about those. So yeah, there is an algorithm. I wondered where our data goes, but apparently it goes to the all-seeing, all-knowing robots who then yes. tell us yes, it does. exactly how much water we're using. Um, does everyone know what evapotranspiration is? No, Joe, yeah. explain it. <laughs> oh. Well, Jeff doesn't, but I guarantee everyone else does. So, <laughs> um, but if you think of a plant to like really simplify it down and make it so it's easy for someone like me to understand. This is how I look at it. A plant is a big straw and grapevine is no different. So basically what this grapevine is doing is sucking soil moisture up from the soil. And as it's doing its photosynthesis thing, it's basically taking that water through a pressure or a concentration gradient or osmotic pressure, if you will. And then that water is coming up and then through these little openings in the leaves called stomata. And that is going up and through the vine and through those stomata and then evaporating out into the atmosphere. Um, and that process happens whenever sunlight is hitting the vine up and until a certain temperature. And so what these Thule sensors are doing is actually measuring the amount of moisture that's in the atmosphere above the vines where these sensors are placed which is just an incredible technology. And it allows us to really get down into the very like microclimate, you know, fluctuations within our vineyard and understand how to very carefully target with exactly what block, exactly the amount of water that we need, which is twofold really. I mean, one, it's a sustainability measure because we're not over irrigating when we don't need to. And then number two, where I get really excited is it's a wine quality measure as well. So basically what we're able to do is completely dictate the growth of the vine. Um, knowing how much water it's using each day allows us to know, you know when to irrigate to get to that optimal canopy growth that Megan was talking about. And you have to have a certain number of leaves on the canopy to ripen fruit, one grape cluster to its perfect ripeness. So you really want just enough to where it gets to there and not enough to where, you know, it's growing so much that it's producing so much fruit that it's getting, you know, watery and drained out. And uh, that lacks that nuance that Jeff was talking about. So totally. things we're not going to dive in, but what, what, if you can, sorry, go back Ashley for one second. Ashley's the play. Yeah, Ashley's actually God in this, in this universe. <laughs> actually. Um, like if you look there, these are all like GPV stands for gallons per vine. And what, what we're really doing is, I mean, this has been something that Jim Bunchu knew intrinsically when, when, you know, he kind of pivoted the vineyard toward the high end, which I've been trying to carry and we're carrying on that tradition. And that's that, you know, you want these vines to actually be stressed. It's unlike like commodity crops where you're just like what you're watering for growth. You're just growing, growing, growing to get the most volume so that you can then sell the most fruit, which you're paid for on the weight. This is more about how you're actually making the flavor profiles like the most intense they can be. And that comes from actually making these grapevines stress. And so this is like stress, this deficit irrigation is really basically a fancy term for stressing the vine right up to the point that it's just putting all its energy that it has into the berries and not a lot left over for the rest of the canopy, to put it simply. But there's a, you know, what this is, is more and more of a nuanced, fine-tuned approach to, to getting there. Um, and as, as, as I sort of alluded to, by definition, it leads into irrigation as a, uh, or, or water preservation as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a topic and as, a, as an approach. We, we don't use a lot of water when we manage a vineyard like this. 
um, which is actually what I'm going to go. We can go ahead and kill that, Ashley. Thanks. We'll get back to the big picture. Um, let's talk about the wines. Yeah. I mean, that's that's why we're all here, right? I mean, I have another why I'm here. question to ask. Why I'm, here. No. I'm going to get there after we drink some wine. By the <laughs> way, Joe is responsible for making all these wines taste as good as they are. Um, we're just lucky that he left the cellar long enough to come out and hang with us. So what are we drinking? It's me and like 10 other people, I will say, but, and actually more than that, if you count everyone who works here. But so we're uh, drinking the 2016 Heritage Chardonnay is what I would start with for you guys. Know. This is, um, to me, this is, you know, kind of our approach to sustainability and to, you know, everything we do about, you know, maintaining a, an estate that started in 1858 is right here. These are 50 year old Chardonnay vines that were planted by Jim Bunchu and his dad back in 1971. Um, and it's still producing an incredible wine. This, people ask what my favorite wine is and I never say what it actually is, but this is about as close as you can get to it. This is an amazing example of how Chardonnay can grow so well here on the Rhine farm and how it can still produce an amazing wine, you know, 50 years after it was planted. Is it, are you sure it's not because that's when you're celebrating your 21st birthday? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that. Um, it's, it's very good. It's really, really good. I mean, and it's so age worthy. And that's, you know, I don't want to get too hippy dippy here, but basically, you know, when you treat you know, the surrounding environment around a vine a certain way. You get very much more age-worthy wines as, as well. You don't just get, you know, these nuanced flavors. You get all those important things, these antioxidants. You know, when plants are stressed, they produce antioxidants, and antioxidants are, you know, anthocyanins and tannins, which are things that I get really, really excited about, and those lead to incredibly age-worthy and interesting wines. So, you know, the more stressed the vine, the more really good stuff that they produce. So uh, this is where um, I'm going to ask the question. I think we needed we needed like a buzzer that goes off every time we talk about a buzzword. Like maybe you can do that Beep! when yeah. I when I say it because I'm gonna I'm gonna say a word that's worthy of a buzzer, which is dry farming. Oh. <laughs> and dry farming, I you know I'm gonna talk about it here because we are talking about water. Um, dry farming is a there's a lot of terms in our industry that are kind of that latch on that are sexy and, and dry farming is one of them. Um, dry farming is technically what it sounds like farming with no irrigation. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, the big question that that comes our way occasionally is do we dry farm? And if we do, if we, if we don't, why not? Um, dry farming is essentially uh, in modern viticulture, I'm going to call it at least in our neighborhood, a luxury meaning that it's, it's not even a luxury because that implies you can do it and survive. Uh, the reality in our neighborhood is that dry, dry farming is something that is you, we can, given our low water holding capacity of our soils, given our weather pattern, given the extent of our dry season in even a normal year, the idea that we could possibly dry farm or pretend that we dry farm is, is kind of a joke because we couldn't do it if we wanted to. Um, in a very, very wet year, we could get away with it. Uh, but the, the reality is given our Wachika clay loam soils, which even on this side have a decent holding capacity, but especially up on the hill where we grow the Cabernet and the Merlot that we do and, and all the red wines that we all love here, it just doesn't have it. So um, you do find it in places like successful, viable dry farming in places uh, where there's a lot of rainfall or where there's really deep water holding or shallow um, you know, water pool. So like along Napa River, for instance, in our neighborhood, I'm thinking about regional Oregon is a whole different story. There's a different water table up there, but on Napa, um, along Napa River, you can get away with, with, um, with dry farming because of the water table being so high, uh, you know, and you can also train vines that way, but the, if there's no water to begin with, it's really hard to sustain it. And in a year like this, as my cousin Toll, our guru would say, like, you know, nobody is, everybody's out there, even with their flower, you know, cans, putting water on the vines because it hasn't rained, you know, driest year. <laughs> I hate, I'm not even laughing. I'm drinking to that. That's horrible. It's pretty, you know, so anyway, um, that's dry farming. We're talking about irrigation. So, but before we get to the next one, I think this is my cue. Look. Oh, we have questions? 
Okay. Do we have any questions? Hey, Jeff, I, I do have a cue from our chat. I have a question that maybe Joe or Megan can um, speak to. And the question is from Dave Rowley. Are building a model that predicts fruit quality based on the data captured by the sensors? If so, how do you train the model? How do you indicate good or bad quality to correlate to the data that's being collected? Or maybe that's just not at all how it works. I can, I can speak to this. So um, when we're, I'm assuming you're speaking about Thule, um, yeah. because that's where we're looking at our different, um, our, what we're watering, where our stats are, um, where our soil moisture lies. Um, it's not necessarily predicting our fruit quality whatsoever, actually. So kind of not, not the same topic, but um, when we're collecting this data, we're, we're streamlining it from all of our different technologies to initiate the best decision possible and when and where we're irrigating. So it's not to predict the fruit quality, it's rather to predict the vine's needs, what they need at the time, how much water they're currently holding and how much more water they need. And that, when you stress it, is what is going to lead to the fruit quality. Maybe that answers your question. Yeah. yeah, and then I can just speak to the wine quality piece. You know, we use, we kind of correlate what we see in the vineyard to the resulting wine. So we'll go back and we'll grade each block out every year. Jeff and I and Keith, our executive winemaker, and, you know, another group of people for a panel and look at, you know, what the, what the vintage produced for us um, for that year for each block and sometimes in cases you know different parts within the block to um, then kind of go back we'll look at the data that we have through Thule because it stays there forever and then kind of try and back figure and understand you know where things went right where things went wrong there's still you know there's no computer program or you know model that's going to going to give you exactly you know x amount of leaves on a on a canopy equals this many points in wine spectator. It's really, we're not there and I don't think we'll ever get there because there's so many different variables that go into what wine quality is, but um, we, we do take it very seriously. And that's where our library of knowledge comes in, you know, from working with the same venues for so long. I was gonna say that about the library knowledge, that is literally where kind of what separates the wheat from the chaff, as far as I'm concerned, when you're talking about like great winemaking in any region and it's that being it's it's the you know the the, the better the data the better we all are but it, it takes being able to take that data not only look at it in the context of the year that you're looking at it but have experience with each site how that site behaves in in a given with a given set of variables assessing the next vintage for the variables that might be in that vintage and using your your data your library of data kind of apply and it's this sort of layered buildup and so you know when you start talking about like how great wines are made um, in my mind you can't separate it out from the people who make them and the people that have been making them and the, and the sort of body of knowledge that they're drawing from um, and it's not it's not just about like being a great blender. It's really about the physiology of the place the grapes are grown and how that place behaves in any given kind of year. And eventually after, you know, what I'd say a decade is a pretty good starting point. You start to see, you know, there are patterns where you always hear winemakers say, oh, you know, 13 was like 11. And then the ones that really want to drop some knowledge are like, oh, that was like, that was like three, and then someone's gonna drop it like, like 98, 1986. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get some 25 year old kid saying, that was just like 1858. <laughs> but, but it's serious, it's like, that's funny, but it really is, uh, it's very critical, at least on our site and the way we go about it to have that kind of continuity. And we're very lucky that we, we do have that. All right, so um, I think uh, what we got going here is a, 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 a uh, <laughs> what is there a bell, another bell, like a giveaway? <laughs> A giveaway. So hold on, a trivia question. All right, trivia question, Ashley. That's the cue. Yeah, oh, we don't have to do it? Oh, okay. So here's the skinny. Um, hold on. Let me find the skinny. Uh, the, the trivia question is you're going to see a, um, a question pop up there, and I swear it's so easy. And there's a lot of numbers. I see so many people down there. Somebody's going to get this. And if you answer the, you type it in, 
to the chat box. And the first person to type this in wins, in this particular first case, a bottle of one a bottle of Chardonnay, but it's uh, 1.5 liters for a party. Let me just tell you something before we get started here. Oh, thank you, Joe. That was my other job. Um, I <laughs> sneakers app. They drop sneakers at any given day at 7 a.m. Pacific. And I can't, I haven't won yet because I type quick and I haven't won, a, won, meaning my opportunity to buy one. You didn't have to buy this. But my point is type fast, no guarantee you win if you don't, but if you, but you can't win if you don't try. All right, <laughs> cowbell, <laughs> should get like a bonus point for that. Um, go ahead, Ashley. Now this is where you put, pop the question up, I think. Nope. Everybody answer to panelists and attendees, not just panelists, please. Thank you. Did we get it? Oh, I saw oh, it. I, I saw, I saw it. it. Okay, we won. Oh, somebody got it. Somebody. We won. All right, let's hope we don't drink this. We, we'll, we'll call your name out as soon as we, we go back through the, the we slow motion the, the enters and we, we'll go to the next section here. Nora. Oh, Nora knows who it is? Oh, what's that? Oh. It is. Well, I'm not seeing it actually, so <laughs> I'm scrolling. Sam's about. back at it. I like it. 53, 43, 107. Here we go. There it is. Am I right? I don't want to say the name if I'm wrong. No, but it, I'll it, tell you what. I'll tell you what. We're going to pull this off. We'll do <laughs> one as soon as we go back to the drawing board. Um, we'll figure out who the actual winner was. Three point one. Three point one. <laughs> Sam is like, Shaq. <laughs> Oh, you're just good. And then I saw it. So, I, yeah. I, All right. So, listen, somebody won. One of you guys did win. We'll, we'll uh, congratulate <laughs> yeah. somebody. Nice, Dave. No, <laughs> not. Um, A couple years of college. Same, uh... Nick. All right. So, we're going to let's go to the next one, huh? Huh, Nora? Next section? Sure, 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 sure. That means Pinot Noir. Okay. Um, and, uh, Oh man, you guys, um, 2019 Pinot Noir. I've been pouring Pinot since I started here, which means the first vintage was 2014. And uh, every vintage I say, oh, well, good luck because the last one was so damn good. And then every year, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mother Nature. Thanks, Valley Floor on Rhine Farm for killing every single year to the day, it just keeps getting better. But again, it is grown on the valley floor of Rhine Farm where it benefits from that maritime influence, the fog from the bay, cool, cool, cool nights, overnight fog, burns off during the day, just enough for ripening for that delicate, delicate Pinot. But this is no delicate Pinot. You'll see, you'll see, put your sniffer in there. It's very aromatic wine. And with that topic, we're gonna go back to Megan about soil health. Uh, Megan, what does that mean? And how, to, how do we apply that to our farming practices? Oh, you're on mute. Oh wait, if you just stand, if you sign, I'll talk. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so what's interesting about soil health is the government and non-governmental institutions actually just just um, adopted this term to raise awareness about soil conservation because we've been losing 36 billion tons of soil from wind and rain erosion alone. So the issue of soil health is really coming into concern. Um, and vineyards in particular, especially those on slopes and marginal lands um, are at a really elevated risk for declining soil health. And so that's really um, a key, key topic for our farming practices. Um, it, declining soil health can lead to impaired um, groundwater. It can lead to diminished air quality, soil quality and soil fertility, all kinds of things. So we're always looking to build our soil health. And a soil health should look, it should support a high yield, a high quality crop. It, um, a healthy soil will have good water infiltration. It'll have the capacity to store water. 
it'll um, retain and recycle nutrients efficiently. So we're, when you, meaning that you'll have a cover crop, it'll recycle those nutrients, bring it into the soil. Um, and it'll also be supplying carbon while sucking carbon in. So we're offsetting carbon emissions at the same time while supplying our crops carbon. So soil health is super, super imperative. Um, and in order to achieve those, we look at different aspects of soil indicators. So we're looking at our soil um, microbiome. We're trying to enhance the different microbiologies that are in there. Um, we're looking at carbon sequestration and crop nutrition. We're looking at soil organic matter content, which is the different types of organic matter that obviously that are present in your soil. We're looking at our water holding capacity. And that is the amount of water that can be held and um, go against gravitational forces. So with all of these uh, soil indicators, we're trying to build them up. And in order to do that, we often are applying cover crops. We actually just went underwent a huge um, soil monitoring um, thing. And we did short-term monitoring, long-term monitoring. We took over 40 samples from all of our ranches and that will help indicate what types of cover crops we need to be applying to the vineyard in order to supply nutrients that are absent. So we're really excited about that. And we're really excited to be able to improve our soil and our organic matter content. Uh, we also are looking, we're doing compost. So when you're applying compost, you're building your organic matter there. Um, and then another way that we can build up our soil is through ruminants. And these ruminants, yes, all of our animals, this makes me happy. Um, hey, Joe's picture's missing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm behind the second cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> um, so our purpose. animals are putting, are being put to a lot of work and we're super excited. We're starting some new initiatives. I don't know if you're in town, but we have a couple fallow lots on the property and we were just able to get those fenced in and they will be electrified soon. But the purpose behind the fences and the fallow lots, we're going to be starting to graze a multi-species, kind of like a savanna type thing. We're gonna get a bunch of animals in there and they're going to be mixing their nutrients into the soil. We're going to be sequestering more carbon. We're going to have a mineral lick which is a bunch of different minerals that the ruminants do not have inside them, inside their urine and dung that can be infiltrated into the soil. And so they'll approach this lick and whatever they don't have, they'll consume and it'll come back into the soil. So it's a super exciting thing that we're gonna be doing to regenerate our soil before we are able to replant it. Because you know we have a bunch of fallow lots and we wanna build the soil as much as possible to make those vines as resilient as possible possible so super exciting stuff and our little donkeys there they also do some fire protection they're scavenging the surrounding woodland areas um and so but our foul i just saw a question about the foul lots we have about 16 acres so 16 acres of regeneration is what we're going to be um, sending those animals to and we're going to do a holistic grazing plan and figure out how we can give as much nutrients to the soil as possible. Because as a monoculture, which is vines, um, we need to be introducing as much biodiversity as possible. Hey, Megan, mm -hmm. um, you, did, you did mention carbon and somebody mm. asked about carbon emissions and reducing them. And um, obviously this is part of it. Um, is there any other things that they, they are asking? Um, any other ways uh, what that looks like from a winery perspective. Sure. So yeah, if you look at a winery, you obviously see rows and rows of vines and not too much. Um, you obviously have your cover crops in between. Those cover crops are really sequestering carbon. Vines actually, because of their deeply rooted systems, are really set up to sequester carbon. And as a climate mitigation, it's been really exciting for scientists to kind of look into vineyards and see what the opportunity is there. So aside from our crop in general, you're also looking at um, shrubs, you're looking at um, trees. So we have a lot of people that do um, 
we do hedges. And so as much as you're planting, as much diversity you can possibly plant in the ground, that's going to be sequestering carbon. As strong as your soil is, that's going to be sequestering carbon. So what our main goal is to regenerate the soil to make it as strong as possible to be offsetting those emissions, especially with our tractor work and things like that. So um, carbon is definitely at the top of our minds. Our goal, we I don't I don't want to like spare I don't know, but Toll and I like we would love to eventually be able to offset everything and become carbon neutral. So we've been doing a lot of different um, partnerships to foster that growth, and it's super um, exciting because we have a lot of development and a lot of initiatives that are underway to do that. Cool. Um, what about the Pinot, Joe? Yeah, um, so when I think of soil health and the importance of it, like I can't help but think of terroir. And to me, there's no better varietal that so viscerally, that's his adjective, expresses <laughs> <laughs> terroir than, than, than Pinot Noir. Um, and what I think, you know, when I think of terroir is that, you know, people often have a misconception about it. And I think a lot of people feel like the, the vines are actually uptaking certain nutrients that you, that end up, you know, expressing themselves in the resulting wine. Like I think of limestone and Chablis, but that's really not what the, the French concept of terroir is about. It's really about, you know, the soil, the microclimate, the macroclimate everything that goes into a grapevine producing it, its optimal point to make the best wine possible. And all those factors and how they interplay to do so. Um, and I can't help but you know, talk of, or emphasize the importance of soil health and all of that because the microbiome that Meg was talking about you know, adds to our water holding capacity, but really also adds to you know, the way the vines take up those nutrients. There's an interplay between, you know, mycorrhizal fungi and the roots and how that is then helping the vines take up water more efficiently, nutrients more efficiently, and making a, a more healthy vine that's able to be more balanced. And then we're able to predict how it's going to grow and then how it's going to make the best fruit possible and then the best wine. So that's kind of how we, we're approaching all of our winemaking is from the ground up is from the dirt and how that really is going to express itself into the glass. I'll just jump in. Um, she mentioned, Megan did that biodiversity, like I, it was, Megan, you're, you nailed it. Like that monocrop, that's something that, you know, it's kind of the white elephant in the room. You, you know, most kind of living environments want to have multiple crops in a different place, but we have these vines that once they're planted, they last 50, hopefully longer years. So it's a whole, important thing to create diversity around essentially a crop that's not diverse. Um, and I think that, you know, the best sort of one of the, one of the silver linings of the whole uh, COVID situation was, you know, in those first months when it was sheer panic and we shut everything down and it was about two months here where I came to this house. I'm in my grandmother, Mary's house with now the office. And, and at that, in those days, everybody was home except for Anna who God bless her was like, managing the HR side of it from one wing. And I felt like the king. I'd come in here in my shorts. I'd ride my bike. Take a sh First one, take a shower here in a long time. <laughs> uh, but what was amazing was that was also there's no people on the ranch. And the amount of animal, it took like, yeah, it literally took, you snap your, it, it took like a literally almost overnight. And there were like animals everywhere um, that, and you know, they're, they're always around, but it was really like they came out of the woodwork and by Animals, we mean everything from bobcats to foxes to rabbits to deer, and especially mountain lions. So, Megan, why don't you come back up here now? You can tell, you know, when Megan talks, she's, you know, she's educated no. in this kind of <laughs> universe. Um, but she is from a, a, a state that's pretty flat um, and, you know, and was just, I think it was, how long were you here? Oh, my gosh. Your first giant animal. And tell us that story. It was about, yeah, it was one or two weeks in of the job. And um, <laughs> we mentioned Toll a couple times. He was training me on the ranches. So Toll, by the way, is a little camera shy. Uh, yes. He's <laughs> the universe um, and eventually we'll bring him on here. 
Um, but I think we've, we've got to ease them into the process. So we'll keep referring to them. So Toll, how's it going? Two weeks in. Yeah, so two, a week or two in, and I'm learning the ranches, learning the blocks, and I'm irrigating. And I go up into La Paz, which is um, where Jim Bunchu, Jeff's dad, if you don't know, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. that's where he lives. And he, there's a lot of, a lot of mountains out there, slope, everything. And I'm driving the ATV up, turning down a row to check all of the emitters, the drip line emitters. And I turn out down the avenue and there lies a massive mountain lion clutched on to a baby fawn, just having its midday meal. And <laughs> Me, as uh, from Indiana, as a complete newbie to California, witnessing a giant mountain lion having feasting on this cute little baby fawn. I freak out, obviously. At the end of it, everyone's like, why don't you take pictures? I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) I go into panic mode. I'm throwing the ATV in reverse. I'm like backing up and it's, we just got our eyes locked on each other and um, he starts dragging, or she, or he starts dragging the fawn up the slope and tosses it over the fence, um, our deer fence, to keep these predators out, which clearly is not doing his job too well. Um, yeah, it was it was terrifying. And then I drive all the way back to the home ranch, and I see Toll pulling out. And he's like, you just like, you look like you just saw a ghost. (laughs) Well, similar. I saw a mountain lion and I think I almost died, but I'm fine. (laughs) So put that into context. uh, You know, Jim Bunch has lived on that property for his whole life. And I, I I don't think he's seen one yet. I mean, we know that (laughs) I've seen two in my life, like in my entire life on the property. And so like, for Megan to roll in and, 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 and by seeing, I mean, have scamper in front of me at night or like a, a blur, like to have her roll into like a mutual of Omaha national <laughs> geographic thing. That's like, that's, it was awesome. It I mean, was that, awesome. Thinking back, was, super awesome. And Mark, our landscaper, I, he, I told him and he's like, Oh my God, that's so cool. How did you take <laughs> pictures? And I'm just basically freaking out. <laughs> Well, I won't next time now that I'm now that I'm acclimated. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that I, we had to bring that story up. We're going to talk about animals. Domestic. Yeah, that's, that's okay, the, I think it's time for another. For so sure. uh, hold on. I think we have some questions here. We'll take a few now and a few toward the end. You want to throw me a couple of these? Uh, uh, I saw some really interesting ones come through. I love it. I love it. We're getting questions. Uh, oh, so that uh, you were up there looking at the lines, Megan, and Hillary is asking about irrigating the vines. So using pulse power systems, how do we do this? So we've been using drip line irrigation for a while, um, for quite some time. Um, it's a way for us to manage the amount of gallons that are um, coming onto the vines in a way for us to measure our water use. Pulse, what was it? Pulse power ear what? Well, yeah, I'll tell you, uh, yeah. I can speak to that because I, you know, I hope I'm gonna drop some knowledge here that's gonna impress somebody. Because when I started, we didn't have drip irrigation. We had like, and I, and, you know, the, the real farmers in the in the valley that still use this technology are probably gonna, you know, I, I don't mean to throw them under the bus, but it is a horrible situation. You literally are laying out miles of, well hundreds and hundreds of yards of aluminum ag with spring ag piping that literally you had you have we had a giant diesel pump tied to our well and you would basically move your irrigate every time you wanted to irrigate you literally would line up your 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 in the middle of the row the big ag water tubes and have to hook them up and you'd run the sprinklers and then you'd move it to the next section and it was it was i mean it used bazillions of gallons and it wasn't uh wasn't very effective. So that was pulsed because those sprinklers pulsed. It's maybe <laughs> you think of it. I don't think it was the technology that you were asking for, but um, the drip irrigation has a preservation component to it, or a conservation component to it, but it also is very useful again for quality maintenance because you can micromanage like what vine gets one water, what, what water, like we'll have. Uh, right. We also have reporting and stuff to do. So oh, we're always looking to. <laughs> oh, the ruminants made an appearance. 
Yeah, okay. we've got some ruminants coming in and hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, buddies. Hey, Jeff, uh, before we get completely nature distracted, do you want to okay. do trivia number two? Oh, yes, trivia number two. All right, for this question, ooh, a really nice bottle. Oh, by the way, the winner. Nick, Nick, <laughs> Nick McCrory, I happen to know you and I'm so stoked you're on here. I swear that I didn't have anything to do with you want on your own. It's because you have those fast trigger fingers on the keyboard. Good job, Nick, on winning that Chardonnay. The next prize is going to be this nice bottle or one just like it of, uh, oh, the answer. What was the answer? 51. 51. 51. <laughs> Patrick, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> All right, so the next one is this Pinot Noir. It's a, it's a heritage Pinot is the, is the winner, is what they're gonna win. Um, let's hear, let's, let's see it, Ashley. What do we got? This one is Tricky Dicky. You all are gonna be ashamed of y'all said. I, I have a hint, that. we have a really big hint that I made him take, ah, there we go. I just saw. Dan no Rapata got it. Uh, Nick was right behind him, too. I know, Dan. I can't even call you out. Was he not first? No. Shit, Dan. I'm sorry, Dan. I know you. I'm sorry, buddy. It's the same here. No, no. I think, I think uh, Dan was first. Dan is first. Dan was first. Dan is first. Dan, you did win. That, uh, you get <laughs> Sorry, Nick. You were fast, too. Damn. Okay, right on. Um, I'm going to the final topic getting through this. So, but but uh, Jeff, I just wanted to say, uh, Dan wrote it only to panelists. So the attendees did not see the answer. Some of you might have not oh. seen it. Well. The answer is Wichika, which is the same as our music festival. Yes, Wichika Kleilong is, uh, is the actual name of the soil and what we named the festival after. Um, and it passed the other test of being unpronounceable. <laughs> Everything we do come on you is hard to pronounce. So there you go. Um, uh, so uh, go ahead, take us away. Um, Merlot. Oh, you guys. Hi. <laughs> yes, Nora. Okay. <laughs> I am clearly on Team Merlot and have zero vanity. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first family in Sonoma Valley to grow Merlot, uh, third in the state, and one of the first um, wineries to bottle it as a single varietal as Merlot, because in the past it was typically used as a blender. But clearly we have been championing it since then for good reason. It is purple velvet, cocoa dusted, herbal magic in a bottle, and it makes my knees buckle, so it's a good thing I'm sitting down. So we are going to pair this low with the final topic, and that is regenerative and organic farming. You guys thought we've been talking about that this yeah. whole time, but man, we are gonna bring it around and tidy it oh, up. Oh, you thought, right? <laughs> oh, but. So, yeah, this whole topic, or this whole conversation has essentially been about <laughs> these guys, no, uh, our farming practices and what we're looking into for the future. And so basically we are shifting from a sustainability perspective to a regenerative, regenerative perspective. What's the difference between that? There's really not much difference. Um, the practices are essentially the same. The tools are the same. It's just the mindset of applying them. And so sustainability seeks to, we're seeking to maintain, we're seeking to preserve our soil. We're seeking to preserve everything to continue. With regeneration, we're seeking to better it. So where you get sustainability, your regenerative is kind of your answer. You're, it's kind of um, hand in hand. So <laughs> this slide, I mean, biodynamic, regenerative, organic, you hear all kinds of different buzzwords out there today. Basically the diff, well, I'll, I'll go over the differences for you. So organic is kind of, a, it's a list of what you can't do. It's a list of your inputs that you're not implementing in your field. It's a list of what you're not doing in your farming practices. So you're, you're not using synthetics. You're not using chemical fertilizers. You're not using pesticides. We're not doing any of that. We, know, we haven't been doing that for a really long time. Um, actually, since the 
the inception of fish friendly farming, we've been uh, sustainable and certified and heading on that path. But what we're really looking at is our outputs now and what we can do to basically take in the carbon, sequester carbon, what we can do to offset our emissions. And so you're looking at biodynamic, that's amazing, it's great, but it's it's kind of um, more of a, um, so it goes on like the lunar moon cycles and we're looking at different types of um, more mystical um, ideologies, whereas regenerative is a little more science-backed, it's a little more what are you doing? What's your outcomes? Like what, what is bettering? What are you looking at in the future? And so that's kind of the differences between those. And then you have sustainability as well. And that's kind of your energy efficiency. You're looking at how, how your pumps are doing. You're running, we run our solar, our pumps on solar. We're running our wastewater ponds on solar. So we're looking at those different aspects, but then regenerative, as I said, you're, we're carbon sequestration. We're looking to regenerate our soil, looking to make our practices better for the long term. Great. Um, I, I, Megan, there's. Can you just make some more noise so we can look at those? Uh, I'll shut up. I want to see this. Let's see these panels. <laughs> so um, here we have. Um, let's see. This is. We got Oreo and what? Who? Um, and who? Bo. Bo. So Bo is super tall. Hi, Bo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there goes All the right. water. There goes so, the water. No worries. We still got the wine. <laughs> we got the wine. <laughs> yeah. So these guys, they um, take care of a lot of our fire prevention. They are in our um, wooded areas, breaking down the dry brush, making sure our canopies aren't connected to the ground to kind of disperse that fire. <laughs> well, come say hi. Say hi. Say hi. Well, I'm just like <laughs> that. Oh my goodness. There we go. Hello. Nice. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so then we, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. I, I want to jump in there because- Please do. <laughs> one of the, one of the, <laughs> you're good. Um, you know, one of the things is like, what, what took you so long? We've been at this a long time to go for something certified. Well, we, let me just clarify, Megan mentioned it. We opted early on uh, in the process as, as the guy that was really pushing for like as much definable sustainability to not go organic because our hands, as, as, as Megan said, it was like a, 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 it was more of a rule of what not to do as opposed to what we could do. And we just wanted to have our hands free, given that all our vines and our grapes in those days came from this site, we didn't source anywhere else that we were just, I was scared that we would get an infestation that would take out half the crop. And so we never leaned into certification, but lean into most of the processes. So the next best thing was a sustainability certification, which you'll see on a lot of wines now, like certified sustainable. I have one little issue with that because the certification body, it's extremely good. It's very valid and it means anything, but just philosophically it, because it's, it's the, this, the uh, anointing uh, body is, a, is the Wine Institute, of which we've been members for a long time or it, periodically. Um, it's an industry sponsored you know, stamp of approval, which as great as it is, like, that's like believing the tobaccos. No, it's not, but it's, it's not quite like that. But I never trust like when the industry is the one telling you that what they're doing is great. So we went with fish friendly farming, which um, believe, you, know, you wouldn't know it even if you've been here, but we have a creek that runs on the north side of our property. And fish-friendly farming is all about ensuring that what you're putting into the soil and you're, you know, that will eventually leach into the creek and in the water system is clean and, and, and great. It basically checked a lot of the boxes in terms of what we needed to do, um, but it was uh, certified by a third party entity, which I really liked, which is this fish friendly farming. It's an independent thing. We're finally leaning into something that is going to be sort of certified this regenerative farming. And it's after a whole lot of sort of investigating, looking under the hood of what it means to be certified organic, um, what it means to be certified biodynamic. Um, none of those felt totally perfect. Or in the case of organic, I mentioned didn't work in biodynamic. It was, I'm a big fan of biodynamic 
wines in particular, and especially some of the people that are my mentors that, that champion that approach. But it's one of those things that I would feel, and I think our family would feel disingenuous if we weren't 100% bought into every component of it. And that's just something that we, we, we never really could get our hands around. This regenerative farming, though, it's, it's the real deal. It's, it's going to end up the byproduct. We will be certified organic. Um, but it's also about you know, putting things back in. And I, I sort of like the theme because it's no longer, you know, it's kind of a theme of, of 2020 and beyond now. And, and a lot of things beyond just the dirt, I'm going to lean a little bit into like our social situation. It's no longer enough to be sort of complacent and sitting on the sidelines. Like the bottom line is you have an opportunity to like make it better, whether it's your neighborhood, your community, uh, your, your dirt, then you want to do that because it leads to a better product in the case of wine, a better living experience in the case of your life. Um, so it's all about that. Um, so that's that's when we talk about you know that we like regenerative because it does hit all those things. It's not just one component of it. Um, enough about that. No, that was perfect. About the wine. That was. That was great. Absolutely perfect. All right. So, oh, wait, that's tall. Uh, hold on. He's <laughs> 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 like, on camera. Oh, ghost. This is like a mountain lion. <laughs> <laughs> he is a mountain lion. He has special occasions. <laughs> All right. What do we got going on in this world? He only comes uh, out yeah. tonight. Um, <laughs> yes. It's that big <laughs> Uh, maybe. Clearly, we are having a lot of fun in gun bun style here. Yeah, we better get up. We better get on to the wine. Yeah, let's talk about this Merlot. He, he's my boss. Yeah, yeah, Merlot. Okay, keep it down. It's the Merlot. Um, anyways, questions, <laughs> trivia. So, I, I think our Merlot really encapsulates what sustainability is is truly all about, which is a holistic approach to the entire farming process in the entire state. And our Merlot is. Interestingly enough, the only varietal that's planted on all parts of our estate. We have some on the valley floor and we have some on our hillside portion of our vineyard La Paz, and they both bring different characteristics to the blend that's in your glass right now. But none of it would really fit together and make sense if we weren't all, you know, using the same practices across the entire vineyard and treating it all with the respect and, you know, the, the targeted farming practices that we need. So it's, um, you know, it really just encapsulates everything we're trying to do here is just to kind of make each part of our estate great through these really sometimes innovative, sometimes, you know, incredibly old farming practices that, um, you know, we've rediscovered are, are the, the right thing to do um, is to treat, you know, our soil, our water, um, you know, every part of this farm as a precious resource and make sure that we're doing it, you know, for the right purpose. So um, it really expresses itself in this class right here. And I uh, hope you guys all enjoy it. All right. Cheers yeah. to that. So. Cheers to that, you guys. Awesome. Man, we're making it. This is like real. We're giving you guys some, we're dropping some real knowledge here. Yeah, we are. Uh, you know, boom, that doesn't happen often on these things. Well, uh, not when I'm on it. <laughs> <Jesus. laughs> all right, so we have a few questions. Um, I think, did we have any that we need to get to before we, we wrap this puppy so up? We are kind of out of time because we have one more um, trivia question and then we have that special musical guest coming back as well. Oh, nice. Um, um, yeah. So we don't want to lose people. We want them to hang on till the last minute. Um, so thank you guys. Jeff, do you want to you wanna ask that final? Uh, I sure will do. Um, I'm just getting rolling. I, mean, I know. You know. I'm like, I thought we started. I mean, Jeff, Jeff, okay, we're good. This is a, you know what? This is a, Jeff, <laughs> so I, this, yeah, I so feel this, bad. This is a way that's going to work. We, uh, as typical Bunchy style, we are nailing the virtual tasting thing right after everything opens up again. Uh, but <laughs> we totally keep doing this because it's a lot more fun. Um, I agree. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's a lot more fun. We love seeing you in person, but we can do this and not have to leave. Uh, you know, we, we can stay home occasionally here. So the questions, uh, sorry, what are we doing? The, uh, the last question, what is the winner going to get? 2016 Heritage Limo. Oh, goodness. Lucky. And another good bottle That's of wine inside the cellar. Okay. So uh, 
I'm hoping that it's the guy with the 83 Merlot who asked yeah. about the 83 Merlot. So hopefully they can compare that. When they oh, compare. is there no slide for this? I have to ask it. No, come on. Slide okay, let's see what this looks like. I, there's got to be a slide. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, David Rowley. Easy. Uh, <laughs> oh, they got it. I think it was. Uh, oh, my God. David, it was David. Rowley. David, right on. Good on you. <laughs> hmm. Jeff, there's a good question about the 83 Merlot and whether that's someone has one and wondering if they're scared to open it. Oh, I, no. I think that's a legitimate fear. I mean, you should always be scared. <laughs> Uh, in life in general. <laughs> so, I mean, here's it it what kept Megan alive when she saw that mountain lion uh, coming down. Um, you know, that is old for a Merlot, for Del Monte Pucci. We've had like 70, you know, the oldest wines we have in our cellar that are like not so old, they're just, you know, but we're actually looking for quality and not just talking points are like 73. Um, so that's 10 years younger than that. That's the good news. You know, the challenging news is that, you know, it's probably a 20% rate of like having a wine like jump out of its, out, out, out at us qualitatively versus a few that are pretty sour. I think that, uh, how would you, I think I know what I would do. I would have that. I would like make a fun deal of opening it. And then I would uh, make sure I had something else that was a little more bankable. And by that, I mean, just a little younger. Uh, so that you, you don't get you don't get lost. You don't have to drink that wine alone. That's how I would approach it. It could be like winning the lottery. <clears throat> could also be a little bit old. It'd be a great one to share with a lot of people and get their opinion and get a little taste. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's really special to have a wine sitting around that long. That doesn't happen a lot of my house. So, no. <laughs> um, I you know I I do remember a couple of questions. One was um about decanting. That was a way way back, but it came up with uh, Dorothy Gator, who is a, for a long time was the wine reviewer at the Wall Street Journal, and she and I were talking, and she actually decanted our Gewurztraminer. And decanting is a fancy term uh, for pouring the wine out, <laughs> like an open, a big thing. And as much as you know, people, and including us, have these beautiful decanters laying around, you can act, you can use any pitcher to do it, and all it's really doing is accelerating the aeration and letting, you know, you could probably speak to the science of it, but essentially letting things open up that have been bound for a while. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, she was talking about how much a decanted diverse demeanor tasted different than the one that wasn't decanted. I think that in our wines, and you can, I wanna see what you say to this, Joe, you know, they all tend to evolve quite a bit in the glass, which only gets exacerbated more if you bother to decan it. What's your approach to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I think it's about kind of knowing your palate and knowing what what you guys, what you like to do. But, you know, I I have the opportunity to, you know, do stuff like that side by side and kind of see the differences. And there are differences. It's more about whether you like it or not. You know, I personally wouldn't decant my reverse demeanor for, you know, a number of reasons. But um, it would be fun to do just to see, you know, what, what the changes are and being able to taste them side by side is kind of you know, really what winemaking is all about. It's a scientific approach to what, what we do. So, um, you know, I think it could be a lot of fun, but in practice, I generally don't decant a lot of wines, but I'm also tasting them right away and kind of have an understanding of what that's going to do. Um, so it, it really is just a wine by wine decision. Yeah, that's basically it. All right. So um, listen, this is where the dance party starts and we say goodbye. Um, I love, I mean, it's warming my heart to see all these uh, these people. I want to answer all of the questions. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we have to leave them hanging for a little I know, it you sucks. Know, uh, but you guys are great. Um, we're going to do this again. We've got, you know, you don't have to live in Sonoma or near to touch us because we'll end up doing this. I, I love doing these things and I love that we can get around the world to, to do it with and talk, talk, talk to y'all. Um, we're going to go out the way we came in, you know, maybe with a little more wiggling. Um, and we're going to bring Alex back in and he's going to sing us out of here. I love it. Thank you, everybody. Can't wait. Hey, Alex. Hey. I'm, I'm back. back.
I'm and back I'm, and, I, and I'm wasted. So, uh, yeah. so let's see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, all right. This is the dance part. Here we go. All right, here we go. Don't look back on the way we met. Don't look back at me now. Don't retract all the things you said. Don't back out on me now. Don't look down on me. Don't look down on me. Don't look down upon me now. Don't look down on me. Don't look down on me. Don't look down upon me now. Strangers on this train who could explain the way we feel. Don't look back at me now. Strangers on this train, we rearrange for something real. Don't look down upon me now. Wow, excellent dancing. That was very fun for me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.